you're showing work, uh, a, a retrospective uh, here that came right from the Whitney Museum of American Art in their new home uh, designed and, uh, by Renzo Piano. And, uh, but the, this is my, is far, now we're in Fort Worth and uh, this is my second show in Fort Worth. Well, it's a, it's a 60 year retrospective which in itself is really unusual. I've only seen, in, to my memory, two 60-year retrospectives, one by Willem de Kooning and one, this one by Frank Stella. It's unusual to be able to see that much of a career in one place. Having said that, it's really difficult to try to condense that length of a career down into a presentation that shows all the twists and turns. Um, but it begins in 1958, uh, right after Frank graduated from Princeton and moved to uh, New York in the Soho area. And it goes up to pretty much the present, 2012, 2014. The, at the dinner uh, during the exhibition, um, I told the story that I went to Frank and said, you know, it has been three decades since you have had a retrospective. And, wouldn't it be great to do one that was on the East Coast and in Texas and then on the West Coast? And he said, nah, I don't think so. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, and I took that, of course, to mean, yes, Michael, you should go right ahead and do that retrospective. And I did. And he hasn't said no. So at the dinner, I said, the fact that you're here tonight, Frank, is encouraging to me. I feel bad to say it or something, or I, I don't understand, but my, just off the top of my head, it look, I like it better here than what I thought, than what it was before, so maybe I'm optimistic about myself and about the work, I don't know. Well, Frank's black paintings were in a very famous show at the Museum of Modern Art called 16 Americans, and it was a show that MoMA did to uh, take account of the importance of some of the best artists in America at the time. Frank was 22 years old. He was in a show with Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Ellsworth Kelly, Louise Nevelson, Richard Diebenkorn, I mean, older artists. And here was this young guy with these black paintings, these seemingly very monotonous, dull black paintings. So that was a bit of a sensation. And then MoMA bought one of the black paintings. That was amazing, a 22-year-old in the collection of MoMA. Well, he was, it, with the copper, uh, aluminum, and the black enamel paint, he would literally go to the hardware store and say, what can't you sell? And the guy would go on that table right over there. And Frank would say, well, how much do you want for him? He'd say, well, what will you give me? And Frank would give him as little as he could possibly give him. So the paint was cheap. It was industrial paint. But, you know, he makes it sound like it was almost Duchampian, you know, a found object. But in this case, found paint. There are a couple of reasons, but the most obvious reason is it's easier uh, and it's cheaper. Uh, so you don't have to get involved with artist colors and artist tools, which are kind of expensive and everything. And uh, particularly if you want to uh, uh, have a work on large pieces. So it was pretty, you know, just it was kind of natural and it just seemed to work for me. Warhol sees what Frank's doing. And Warhol, in, in, in a couple of his books, acknowledged Frank very early on for um, his use of series to make it, to take an image and then develop in a series, either through variations in color or variations in size or variations in the form. So Frank was very influential on, on pop art and of course was also considered one of the main people of the uh, uh, op art movement which is the optical, about opticality and what color does, because Frank was using colors that were very aggressive. He was one of the first to use fluorescent and day glow paints. I mean, that seems so long ago, but um, he, was, he was there. The best thing about being the father of minimalism was I wasn't the first father. Uh, <laughs> Barnett Newman was the first father of minimalism. And when he was asked about being the father of minimalism, he said, well, who's the mother? I might say, you know, who's the mother of maximalism? 
at the end of the day, you know, in this exhibition, there is an early minimalist painting next to a very, very late sort of surrealist looking thing. And when I brought Frank in to look at it and showed him that I put them next to each other, he goes, it was amazing, Michael, that when I made that painting in 1958, I had no idea what kind of a painter I would be. And there's no way I could ever guess that I would make that painting. What I liked about Caravaggio is that people were so happy that it was so real looking. And so then all of the emphasis was on the idea that uh, Caravaggio had this skill and developed this technique uh, to make uh, images on a flat surface uh, look real. Uh, and I saw a painting in, the, I think, the Capitoline Museum, a, a John the Baptist painting by Caravaggio, and it looked real to me. And I thought, well, that's great. I can see why everybody loves that, and it looks really real. But I didn't care that much about the illusion, how the illusion was real. It was real to me in the sense that he wanted it to be, a, the effort that went into it was painting, and he painted in a way and made the effort uh, to make, the, to make the, the effort, the reality was in the pictorial effort uh, to express the image. And so the, uh, how real it looked wasn't the reality that I was looking at. I, the reality I was looking at was the reality of being so involved in picturing something, making a picture. Frank's work has always been about making painting very material and giving painting a presence in space that it had never had he probably will transport to something else. He always, I mean, he's constantly changing. That's what makes Frank Stella, Frank Stella. I mean, Frank Stella is always fighting against himself. You know, he sets up these systems, he sets up these way of workings, and then exhausts them, picks up the pieces, and makes up a new thing.